This is the Ampower Podcast, released July 17th, 2022, with Ron Demko from AVX. Ron is a 40-year industry veteran in the capacitor manufacturing industry, and this is a uh, discussion about film capacitor failures and capacitor manufacturer and other failure modes in general. This episode of the podcast is best experienced in the video form factor available on the Ampower YouTube channel, because in this podcast, Ron and I discuss various slides that we're showing up on the screen and various images that we're discussing, but hopefully you'll still find the discussion interesting in an all audio podcast version. Okay, well, as it turns out, it looks like I'm wrong. So we have an expert here who's joining us, uh, Ron Demko from AVX. Thank you, Ron. You're going to tell us what I've got wrong because I thought this was a self-healing issue, but you don't think so. Yeah, I think we could we could give you some details on on the real event. All right, thank you. So, what's your role at um, AVX? How long have you been there? Well, I just passed forty years. And Whoa! So I've been here for a while. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's it's funny though because the company changes. So every three or four years, we buy a new division. So at one point in time, it was just capacitors. Now it's antennas, connectors, uh, modules, a whole bunch of other things. So yeah. Right. I work in a small group in R&D, and we do engineering support, things like that. Got it. But you're mostly, but you're the capacitor guy, right? You're in the capacitor. Yes. Yep. That's your specialty. 40 years, yes. in, ca- 40 years in capacitors? Uh, well, yeah, different types, glass, tantalum, electrolytic, ceramics. Tell us your opinion. What am I seeing here? What, what do you well, think this problem is? Because you don't think that it is... Uh, being destroyed by impulses on the mains. That's right, yeah. Well, I think we, we should start going back and looking at the parts. So mainly these parts are our non-hermetic. Um, they're using a low-cost epoxy. So, you know, they're very cost-effective, easy to use, easy to choose. So it's a probability that moisture got in in the application. And then that moisture was trapped with that non-hermetic case. So mm. what we have, well, there's also another scenario. There could be poor drying in the manufacturing process and possibly materials were, uh, uh, you know, water was put in there. That's very unlikely. So I think what we've got is uh, a couple of easy explanations. Uh, of course, those small holes or maybe mm-hmm. the big hole that, that you have up on the upper right there. Right. Is, that's a result of actually self-healing. Okay. So that's the vaporization, as you'd mm-hmm. expect. Now, when we start getting into the other area, we, we could explain things kind of easily. Um, as you roll this thing out from the left to right or right to left, you've noticed that there's a variance. Some of that variance is due to the difference and the connectivity from the shoopage on the termination mm-hmm. to the actual electrode. So uh, at one point in the video, you showed a very light uh, background with some speckled um, you know, scenarios. And that was just moisture and a high resistance scenario. But right. what we're seeing here is in the, the, the crack lines, uh, the, the lightning bolt looking thing. Yeah, right? that goes right. That, that almost went through the whole thing. Yes, that's right. So I think right. what you're doing, you, you have this electro, um, well, this, this reaction of, of the moisture. And what's occurring is that you're getting a, uh, a, a moisture effect that's actually causing the electrodes to change. Uh, they're getting more resistive. They're getting some, uh, some migration or movement, oxidations, changing resistances. So those voids are most likely, to some extent, like a micro healing or a uh, impulse degradation. Uh, that's how I'd explain that lighter center section. Mm-hmm. And the darker blotches are yeah, most these. likely a result. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Those are going to be most likely a result of end termination corona type uh, effects. Something on that order. Um, so it's always difficult to uh, comment maybe, what, 15, 20,000 miles away or so. <laughs> yeah. Right? Um, and not having dealt with the parts. 
but I think that's pretty much the scenario. It's definitely a moisture event. So will the moisture like eat away at the metal? Will it like yes. actually corrode the metal? And what, what sort of metal are we talking about here for the metallization layers? Well, in some cases there, there's zinc, but this most likely is not the case. It's usually aluminum. It's probably on the order of 100 angstroms. Uh, the dielectric thickness itself, so the film itself, is probably in the order of maybe 1 to 20 microns, something like that. So it, it's a wonderful part when they work well, <laughs> and I suppose it worked in a sense. <laughs> it worked. But, uh, well, this one is only a year old. See, that's the thing. That's why, because when, when I think of moisture ingress, all I think of is like old school reefer paper capacitors, which are famous for, you know, getting moisture ingress. They crack, the cases crack, moisture gets in, it is absorbed by the paper. And then when you go switch it on, you've got this big conductive path that just goes boom and the magic smoke escapes. Um, I, I just didn't expect that this, that moisture ingress with film caps after like a year in you know it's it, the actual product it came from is only a year old yeah i can make a couple of guesses on where the um, moisture came in and, and that's a yep. big issue choosing the right epoxy mm -hmm. is is tough and, and i'm sure these guys build great capacitors it it, uh, it could happen to anyone but uh, the right material systems the the it's a it's a real secret right yeah and is that something you can test like after you've yes. constructed them Yes, that's a very good point. So how do you do that? What we could do, yeah, we'd, we'd put them on a moisture humidity test. Uh, mm -hmm. you maybe, maybe it would be good to have 40 degrees C and, I don't know, 40% RH and maybe another 40 degrees C and, and an 80% RH brood out of humidity cell and then do an 85-85 cell. And what we would look at, we would look at the degradation of capacitance across time. And that would tell us a lot of things about uh, what's happening within the device. Mm -hmm. uh, then we'd probably go in with EDX and we would do some uh, X-ray uh, ev evaluations of, of where the material systems have broken down and, and constituency of water, et cetera. And you're not the only one with this um, opinion as well. Um, Tom um, Zednik, if I'm pronouncing yes. that correctly, who's a former colleague of yours from AVX and is now over at um, EU uh, Passive Components, EU, he's right. also of the same opinion that this is a moisture ingress problem and not a, not really an impulse. Because as you said, some of those small little points in there might be self-healing. Is that certain? Those that, is, is, is that the size of hole you'd expect from self-healing as from an impulse thing? Yes. Yeah, it's right. pretty neat too to, uh, to throw these on a sample scope and, and apply, a, I don't know, a, a couple of different signals to them. Mm -hmm. And you'd actually see some noise occurring when we have self-healing events. So that'd be a neat, uh, I don't know. Noise? What sort something. of noise are you talking about? Well, you'd actually, you know, apply maybe full voltage at, at maybe a moderately high temperature. And you might actually see some failures punching through. And mm -hmm. you'd actually see some variation in the applied voltage of the part as this thing coronas. So right. when, when you get those little micro uh, healing points, you actually vaporize that electrode material mm -hmm. and as it cools it precipitates around that failure site so if we could blow this up a little bit more with a sam or something like that we yep. actually see a little dark halo around that white point of failures i i might put this under the microscope and see if i can see that so this large hole here i don't think that's a blow i don't think that's a self-healing blow hole would it would you get one that large well, you could. It depends what hits it. I think that's maybe more unlikely. Maybe I've now, torn it some... there. Is it possible yes. that I've torn this when I've taken it apart? Yeah. Yeah, I think <laughs> you did a good job on the DPA, but I think we might have approached it a little bit differently. Right. Okay. So, well, it was my first time. A... Okay. <laughs> oh, you did. Good. We'd still hire you. Uh, all right. Hey, but, all right. Good. <laughs> um, one of the things there, though, is there's also a possibility unlikely possibility but there's a possibility that the metallization come to come off of the film right um, so if you had the counterpart of that roll you could see if that was a deposit i i side. think i did see that as as i was unrolling it looked like some of them peeled apart so yeah i i wasn't sure if i had the correct layers or whatever um peeled so yeah i wasn't oh, really it's hard to yeah do. Are there like qualified parts that would be better qualified for moisture ingress? 
like would you like do you sell for example higher quality ones that are better like you know look we guarantee these ones are hermetically sealed and you won't get moisture yeah. in well we don't have hermetically sealed films from what i know right. i don't know that there are any well i almost take that back there's films in cans so okay they're they're hermetic okay but uh, they're right. a much different application but i think in reality some of the progress that's been made on the encapsulants could get you such a near hermetic case that you would never experience this right so if it's in a metal can that's by definition hermetic is it if it's welded yes, if it's a welded yeah, well, can many yeah. companies will take great care in ensuring the atmosphere within that that device yes i, I mean, don't think i've films. ever seen well, a metal I, a metal can film capacitor is is there such well, a thing yeah there is so i oh, mean okay. some of these guys are oh big. the bigger ones all oh, right the yeah, big really bad boys guys. okay yeah. right and we made yep. them about the size of uh, half of a foster can but, right uh, you know <laughs> you're right <laughs> yeah not surface mount though okay got it so when you like the ones that we're we tore down here where's the sealing point is it the potting is it the, when they potted is that what they're trying to do is that they're trying to seal it as best they can yes or right, right. Yeah, okay so if the potting's the poor be, yes uh, it would possibly be at the perimeter of the metallization to right. the uh encapsulant right okay and then through the sh uh shoopage on the side really it'd come in through the yes. side it wouldn't come in through the actual film wrap would it because i would it's, imagine that that's pretty sealed it's correct that's correct right it would be at the interface of shoopage or some uh, errors or voids in shoopage got it okay well we've got a we've got a failure modes document failure modes well, oh i can't i can't zoom that up but i can put an yeah. overlay up here um so this actually shows the failure modes doesn't it or the most likely failure modes in sequence yeah, there's some some good information there um i think possibly the um the the snapshot of the fuse areas or the other one that showed the uh the punch through is is a good way to look at it generally speaking you could say there's two types of films there's the smaller low power films and they're dealing with that thin metallization on the dielectric so we've got mm -hmm. maybe 100 microns and um in small scenarios we'll have a punch through we'll have the cooling of that uh vaporized metal and it, it heals and we drop cap a little bit um, right. so that's one case and then when we get to very high power films there's actually micro fuses that multiple companies put on their product so normally you'd think that that um, maybe scribing fuses and here we go on the bottom part of number four uh, you could see that there's tiny electrodes and uh, little little uh, connections between those electrodes. Right. And that's so, a, so a little grid, a little square pattern, yeah, a little square exactly. boxes with yeah. little conductive parts between them. Okay. Yes. And the trick is going to be to make sure that those fuses don't die under certain use scenarios of the film. And now that's more common with the really big films, the ones that are maybe, I don't know, 20 kilowatt drives or something like right. that. Right. So, you, so you wouldn't find those on surf, little surface mount jobbies or the small ones for mains and things well, like that. They could be, but I'm not, I don't think that anyone has that. For the application that we're looking at um, here, which is like a uh, capacitive dropper kind of um, thing to power a circuit, which you probably uh, apparently shouldn't use X-class caps in this situation. Is that uh, something that you I'm are familiar with? That. Yeah, okay. I, I, you might be able to get away with it. Right. I'm kind of surprised about the failure. Usually films are incredibly reliable. Now, their, yep. their disadvantage is that they're quite large on a relative basis for the amount mm -hmm. of cap you get. But of course, the, the self-healing and some of the other low noise characteristics greatly outweigh that. Right. So is moisture the most probable failure mode? Because apparently the, if you're in the industry, there's other YouTubers out there who tear apart, you know, these cheap Chinese little, you know, $5 gadgets. And these caps just fail all the time. Um, is it most likely to be 
a moisture problem causing this or um a or a capacitance loss due to impulses and self-healing Within films i well it, you know it's difficult because if you don't get self-healing correctly it mm -hmm. could very well have an early failure so right. that's something to be cautious of usually the industry is getting much better with that i would mm -hmm. say in the old days it was well over half uh being caused by that early wear out I think it's probably switched. Yeah, so it's probably moisture. Probably moisture. There you go. Um, I thought it was only the reefer caps that had moisture <laughs> um, problems and a year into it too, just a, you know, a year old product. Um, I just thought, wow, you know, and it's losing so much capacitance. So it just eats away the metallization layers and causes a drastic drop in capacitance, which then of course, um, if you're using it as a capacitive uh, dropper, that changes the value and that screws up your circuit. Yeah, that's right. Completely. So, yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, <laughs> thank you very much, um, Ron. That's, um, yeah, that's something I was, I went into this video thinking that it was a an impulse um, self-healing issue due to capacitance, but it looks like it's probably a, a manufacturing moisture ingress type issue. So there you that's go. Right. Hey, and I'll tell you, Dave, if if, uh, if we have a failed cap, yeah. a, one of these big power caps yeah. that are about the size of a, I don't know, a cabinet, file cabinet, Ooh. It's 100 Ooh. kilograms, Ooh. and if they're out on the, the uh, you know, Asia and such, I'll, yeah. I'll be able to ship one to you if you want one. So, oh, yeah. So I sometimes think they're dented. They're right. Yeah. But it'd have to be shipped by boat. <laughs> it'll have to be yeah, shipped they, they by the are. slow boat. <laughs> they yeah, physically yeah. ship by the slow boat because you can't put them it's on the plane. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Oh, but yeah, we're wow. in CERN and stuff like that. So like in CERN, when you we start getting into concerns or, you know, other power drives, right? We can't have mm -hmm. a, a compressor go down because of a failed cap. That's mm -hmm. where those uh, really big guys are used. Right. Okay. And these are all, would, would these be made to order? Or whatever, like these giant Many ones. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. are. I mean, some of them are like seventy-five kV, massive, massive wow. amounts of energy. Of course, you could do directed energy and some things like that. <laughs> but uh, the little guys, they kind of come off of a like a bicycle wheel that yeah. has the film wound around it, and then they're just oh. cut in a certain arc. Right. And then they're put into a frame. They do the shoopage, and you know, we're done. So what is the shoopage material um, that you guys use mostly, or, well, you know, or does I, it vary? Or it is it a secret sauce? <laughs> I, I think there's part of that too, and I'm, most of it's I've forgotten, so <laughs> it's difficult. <laughs> right. I, I have to admit, though, I've done that on many years ago when we were experiencing some different material systems. Okay. Uh, we we're actually trying to shoop upon um, glass uh, for a variety of things. Mm -hmm. But uh, th that's made a lot of progress through the years. You know, it's interesting though. So shoopage might have a, Do they might go 0.8 that... millimeters or a millimeter in. Yeah. And other, other, just to put it in perspective, right? So some of the other accuracies on our processes, not films, but other types of caps are one micron line width. So that's, you know, it's getting down there, right? And then if we look at the thickness for a high CV ceramic capacitor, well, mm -hmm. some of those might be uh, 0.4 micron particles and two micron uh, dielectric thickness. So there, there, a lot's been going on in the world of caps. Right? Yep. Oh, it's it's phenomenal. The number, the variety of caps is, it's just dozens and dozens and dozens of them. It's just yeah. incredible. So you, can, can you take us through some of the uh, technology? I think this one's kind of neat because yeah. it shows, you know, we went from the bigger caps Remember the old, and in my early career, I remember we couldn't put a 0.1 and a 1210. <laughs> right. And, you know, that's amazing, right? Yeah. So, so that's 0.1 microfarads, folks. Right, 0.1 microfarads. In a 1210 right. size <laughs> capacitor. That was the old days. And, and we're talking Im, imperial here, not the new metric um, sizes <laughs> right, either. Right. <laughs> so, so now we could do that 0.1 in an 008. 04 or an 0105 <laughs> if we want to talk a big part right i i, so I don't even know what that size is i mean it's so ridiculously right. small oh it's teeny in fact we could do one mic in an 0105 it's under development so wow. you know what's happened 
one microfarad. Uh, yeah, uh, it, yeah, <laughs> it's it's hard to believe, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, so it's crazy. The, the miniaturized so, parts are yeah. really a huge impact on everything. But you pay a penalty for that, don't you? In the dielectric yes. you have to use, and the performance is absolutely terrible, isn't it? There's no way you can get a quality performance dielectric in that small with that higher capacitance. Right. Is it's not right? going to be stable yep. with temperature or with applied voltage yep. or with time. Yeah, even even some AC noise on that, some ripple. Right. Oh, right. Yep. But uh, so, yeah, it's, it's amazing mm -hmm. what's been going on there. So, There's a low inductance aspect yeah. to this as well. Um, when we look at the old days, maybe a 1206 mm -hmm. was a nano Henry of inductance. And now the uh, 0204 might be 120 pico Henrys. But there's other termination mechanisms where we're terminating on the side, so we mm -hmm. terminate on the long length, and the electrodes are perpendicular to the board, so we have a very low loop inductance. Right. And, um, we could get inductances of a capacitor down to maybe about uh, well, maybe 25 to 40 picohenries. Wow, that's, course, that, yeah, that's, that's insane. That's just yeah, crazy. That, you, you would get more on your traces going to the yes. component on your PCB than in the cap. Yeah, you have to be really careful yeah. because you could mess up a very highly performing cap with a bad layout. <laughs> a bad layout, yeah, exactly. But, I mean, it, it does so much for you in terms of the resonant point and the ability to, mm. to uh, supply you know, high DIDTs to so many different types yep. of circuits. We might be doing low, di low side drivers on LiDAR, we might be FPGAs, et cetera. Uh, but a lot of work has occurred in, in the uh, material stability. And is that what that's, this is showing here, the stability? Yeah. What we have is uh, there, there's some DC biases. They vary by dielectric type. They actually vary by lot as well. So engineers should oh. be very cautious. <laughs> yes. Okay. Right. Okay. So one vary. product may not perform the same as the one next month because it's a different lot. That's if you don't design it, true. if you don't. If, 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 if you're working in a, such a critical application where that matters. Yes, or you could contact the manufacturer and we'll, we take these questions every day. Right. And we give you certain series within high cap dielectrics, which are stable. And on the mm -hmm. right, you can see how much it varies by manufacturer. Now all, and this comes from EPCI, European Passive Components Institute, that's Dr. Zenichik's site. Mm -hmm. uh, he's done a great job in showing the overall performance of, of some of the key players. And you can see the variance is just major. Yeah. But as we said, if, if you take care, talk to the manufacturer, you could choose the right one that's going to greatly minimize uh, changes on a lot-by-lot lot basis. Especially if you're on the perform high performance aspect side of things, yeah. choosing the absolute, and there, there's where you can't change brands, you can't change supplies, you know, like even batches yeah. might have a problem. You might have to uh, select on test, even perhaps. Well, if you're if you were careful that, and talk yeah. to the manufacturer, you're safe. Okay, yeah. got it. Yeah. Yeah, and and you can see here or we're looking at the uh, various uh, amounts of uh, variance because of ripple mm -hmm. on uh, dielectrics that gets significant. Yeah. So it's it's quite possible that if you're not aware of the phenomena of the dielectric instability with bias voltage and temperature and time, uh, you might think you have maybe a one mic part and you're down to oh, I don't know, 150 <laughs> or 200 yeah. uh, microfarads. Yeah, that's a real, real big disaster. deal. Uh, so, yeah. so, 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 what is the latest greatest dielectric? Um, is it like that that gives you the highest volumetric capacitance per unit size? Well, you know, great progress has been made in the ceramic world. So, mm. particularly now that AVX is part of Kyocera, uh, the Kyocera group has a very big stability effort going on. They've made some tremendous material changes there in ceramics. Mm -hmm. So, that's really important. And that's going to occur across the world. I mean, as manufacturers, we know that we have to have more stable ultra miniature parts. Yep. If we start looking at other types of dielectrics, and of course, dielectrics are everything in terms of cap uh, performance. Yes. We could talk about uh, the tantalum polymers. They have a lower ESR. It's approximately, you could argue, it's about one eighth of a traditional MNO2 tantalum. So that allows us to get 
about eight times more current. Right. And wow. the great thing about that is they're incredibly stable. Mm -hmm. So that, that's a big deal. And then in the world of super caps, well, we could give you one farad part in something that's maybe six millimeters by uh, in diameter, about uh, uh, nine or ten millimeters high. That's yeah. that's crazy. What at at what voltage? Like three volts well, or something? Yeah, about <laughs> yeah, yeah. Three. yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Now those you want to derate. So uh, right. uh, okay. you go up by ten degrees C, you, you have yeah, to yeah. light. And every time you go up by like a point one volt, you have to light. And, and Sorry, did you say every time you go up 0.1 volts, you halve yeah. the life? Yeah, roughly speaking, <laughs> point yeah, one. there's a great paper on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I'd it's see a good the curve on that. With, <laughs> yeah, there's a good life to start with, though. Oh, wow. Well. Yeah, but, uh, you know, in fact, though, there's a, hmm. there's a lot of those in vehicles now, uh, whether hmm. it be our, uh, our dashboards or the dying gas on your uh, emergency call circuits and um things like that it's, it's it's really interesting is is hey, is that to keep like emergency power there just in case yes. the electrical systems fail and well or something, yes or? in the case of the e-call it's used for um backup so you can get that one call you know i've had an accident at whatever mile post right yeah um and for the case of um well there's there's an interesting case on on some of the trucks here in, in the states there's an inverter and that inverter has a buffer with a large super cap that mm -hmm. goes essentially to the alternator. So, you know, as you plug in some oversized saw like everyone does, and I'm guilty <laughs> of, you don't uh, cause problems down line. Right, yeah. got it. Hey, but this slide is really neat. Yeah, because it these, talks about, these are tandem, yeah. uh, these polymer tantalums. Yep. These yeah. aren't and these then, aren't your old school daddy tantalums that blow up. No. These are uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> well is there benign. is there still a is there still a flame issue with these types of uh No, no. The, polymer the tantalums, tantalum right. polymers, they're all benign. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Very and, good. <laughs> um that they're incredibly good inductance and great mm. stability. So these are gonna be solid as a rock. And what we've seen is many times you're going to want this bulk cap that's stable, low inductance and all of that. So you use this in conjunction with uh, some of those high CV, less stability ceramics. Uh, so you'll, you'll see this around all of uh, FPGAs and, and some uh, cores and things like that. Um, yeah, there's the low inductance yeah. stuff. Tell us about how you minimize inductance by, by case size. Yes, what we try, well, of course, as you go with a smaller case size, mm -hmm. as you can see, the, the first column shows you know, 1206 all the way around to 0201. Yep. Uh, we drop the inductance, as you'd imagine. That's because we have a lower loop area for the uh, for the end terminations. Mm -hmm. So the next slide over is called the LICC, and uh, that's where we just terminate on the long end. Yep. So we could drop the inductance by a factor two. And mm -hmm. then there's a device that looks like a cap array, I believe. I'm not sure if we have a slide on that. But yeah, there we go. Yeah, okay. there so we go. We further yep. drop. Yep. And yep. Uh, the last one looks like a, a uh, an LICC. Yep. Uh, well, so it's the this one here is four, is, is this four caps in one? No, I, yeah, that's a good no. point. It looks like a cap array. Yeah, it does it look isn't. like a cap array, right, okay. Yeah, what we've done there is we've just put alternate terminations on the part. So oh. you have essentially uh, a single part with, you know, four term <laughs> terminations on it. Yeah. Hey, now it's interesting too. I, I could get you a free AVX Kyocera AVX shirt if you guess the number. On a 1206, how many IOs could we put on it in theory? A 1206. How many pins you're talking about? How many pins? Yeah, how many land grid array pads could we put on it? On a 1206, uh, 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 point, uh. Uh, hang on. Don't guess uh, You're going to make me feel uh, bad. <laughs> uh, um, I d I d I d eight per side? No. No, oh, nope. it's more than that. No, 12, 12 per side. Uh, we could do, well, we could do 32 on the bottom side of the package. <laughs> yeah, so you never want to use that. But the point is that the metallization <laughs> accuracy is so good that putting eight or even 10 yeah. isn't that big a deal. So wow. I think we've got yep. further reductions coming in low inductance. And, and I'm a big Good. fan of land grid array caps. Right. Uh, and, and in the world of RF, it's, it has a lot of uh, advantages where we could drop parasitics. 
So, so what is the uh, difference between the the array one, the array, pin array like this, and just the one big strip like that? I would have thought this would have been better. Uh, well, the, it's it, it depends on the case size. So in the right. the uh, if we look at like an 0603, the standard 0603 part would be about let's say 450 uh, pico henrys. Mm. So in the LICC, this part, or excuse me, the this looks like an LICC, but it isn't. Uh, that's going to be on the order of about a couple hundred. And uh, maybe maybe you could say, oh, I don't know, 110 or so and the best. But this land grid array part, the part that has the vertical electrodes, that's about 30 pico henrys, maybe 35. Okay. Yeah, so now the trick there is <clears throat> that we have the electrodes vertical to the board. Mm -hmm. And in the RF world, I don't know if you played around with a lot of ham radio stuff, but- oh, I'm, not, do, I'm not an RF guy, <laughs> no. Well, all, all that's cheap guys will take uh, a bad capacitor, at least before I worked here and they gave us free caps to experiment. Yeah. What, uh, what we do is we take the, uh, a cheaper cap and place it vertical on the board and you'll get a better frequency response. So you naturally oh, okay. reduce the inductance that way. Right. So you'd flip your SMD part <clears throat> up on its end. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, so and you'd get better. Only certain case sizes. Right. right. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. But when the math works out. And it doesn't fall over. It's a good. It's a good solution. <laughs> yeah. Oh, terrific! Or you'd put multiple ones in parallel on the same pad vertically. Yeah, you could do. It. In fact, that's a good point. There are larger case sizes, and in fact, there's mm. a new military spec coming out that allows the manufacturers worldwide capacitors to take capacitors and put them vertically or horizontally in between mm -hmm. a lead frame. And now you have a very low ESR, low inductance bulk cap. Right. So a lot of those are flight systems. Ooh. Yeah. And would you know this? Um, you, you, it'd probably be in the sales department or something, but what is the most popular size these days, like per, in volume? What would you make most of? Like in terms of I, just a regular SMD ceramic cap? I, what I, would I don't be... think it would be any larger than, <clears throat> than an 0402. It's probably an 0201. Right, and yeah. 0201, oh, is that probably yes. driven by the mobile phone market, I guess? or I think it would be. Driven, yeah. right. Now, in fact, I was dealing, I, I get lucky because I get work on many different programs per day. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were dealing with a satellite company looking to do an 0201 flight cap. So they're not yet at that point as an industry. But uh, I'd say 0402 would be the right. realistic spacecraft limit. Okay, is that because the smaller you get, the less qualified you can you can make them? I guess the less, like the more vulnerability you have in terms of physical variation and physical failure yeah. modes. That's or... pretty true. Yeah, it's good intuition. So what happens is when you think of this part, if we were to do a cross section, um, think of vertical electrodes or chunks of metal that have to be isolated from the outside world and moisture, right? <laughs> yeah. Because of, uh, you know, the effects it would have on it. So even and in ceramic, ceramic caps, you have moisture issues that you can have moisture issues as well in yes, cer if you had a ceramic crack parts? in here, right. moisture would again, we drop our insulation resistance and then we have a problem. Hey, but by the way, there's parts that have terminations that have a sub metallization of a conductive epoxy. And that conductive Ooh. epoxy, it will actually allow you to bend the printed circuit board and not have a crack propagate in the cap. Multiple manufacturers okay. have it. Yep. It's, it's a really big deal. And yeah, well, I've done, this is, I think, the next slide. I've done a video on this and um, ceramic capacitor cracking and board flexing and, and how this can cause shorts and fires. I've, I've had my own uh, products catch on fire um, because of, you know, the board is flexed and, you know, people mount them. Uh, it's also a PCB construction, a PCB layout thing. If you put it too, too near to a, a screw point, for example, like a mounting point, for example, just screwing in your board into your chassis can cause a uh, crack in your capacitor and boom, up yeah, it goes. Or, it could be a disaster. Yep. Yep. Yeah, and especially on a, on a car. Imagine like terminal 30 yeah. power at all time. Boy, you got real trouble. 
shock and so, vibration is is crazy business. Um, yeah. Is is it mostly shock, or is can you get cracks through vibration as well? I'd assume that's less common than shock impacts. That, that is true, but there's actually a paper <laughs> that I believe was done by NASA that talked about um, a vibration induced. Um, crack it's very right. uncommon in fact hey but you know it's interesting most of the failures on a capacitor ceramic capacitor specifically mm -hmm. are application errors um and so if we talk at let's say a, th a million failures right or something like that i bet maybe less than 10 low oh, goodness less than that it would be less than uh well we got to look at maybe 100 million caps <laughs> so so maybe one is the manufacturing error and the rest of them usually are mechanical issues right it, it's amazing yeah. the percentage it's it really is wow yeah well i'm i'm stunned that you can even make them this small or you know i'm stunned that anyone would want to use ones this <laughs> this right. small but I, I i guess you have to right that that's the progress but as you said um certain applications military and space and or uh, you know airlines or something like that want to they're very on the safe side so they're going, oh, yeah, we'll use these 0201s, but I don't know. Seems a bit like, <clears throat> yeah. Right. It, well, I guess it takes years for them say, to qualify. Oh, well, it does. Yes, it yeah. does. And, and if we look at a comparison between a military, well, a flight part and uh, the highest capacitance, high CD part, mm -hmm. you could probably say the uh, dielectric is four times thicker on the high rail part. Wow. So now lots yep. changing and it'll continue to change. Particle sizes of the ceramic are going to get smaller. So uh, we'll have less E field per, uh, per grain, mm -hmm. things like that. But uh, for the most part, I, I, there's going to be some practical limit where we're not going to really go underneath it. I thought it right. might have been 0201. Certainly it isn't. And uh, it, maybe I'll bet... <laughs> it, uh, well, there was one more iteration after 0105. Right. Can can you explain? You mentioned E field per grain there. Can you explain what that is? Yeah. If we look at, I should have given you a better diagram. Do we have? Uh, if we looked else? in between the electrodes. Yep. No. Uh, we would actually see uh, the grains almost stacked up between them, and what you'd like is maybe. X number of grains, so you could divide the electric field across each grain, and if one what, fails, what, you don't. What actual material grain are we talking about, though? Uh, barium titanate, so it's, it's right. a ceramic it's grain. A, right, yeah. okay. Right, so they're actually, yeah. so they're granular? Yes. At the at the yes. physical level, they become, they're, they're actually a granular structure? Yes, yeah. Oh, it's, interesting. It's I, I assume. fired into a monolithic block. Oh. And the grain sizes are usually on the order of about, well, well, it varies there again by manufacturer composition, but we could say maybe a half micron or so. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I always just assumed it would be a solid ceramic material, but you're saying it's grains compressed. Yes. Okay, yeah. right. Wow, that's something yeah, I didn't it's know. It's really neat. So we, we build this by taking a ceramic, milling that ceramic to a certain particle size, mm -hmm. and then suspending it in a binder so it almost looks like paint and then we'll pour that paint out on a uh, stacking mechanism and uh, then we will dry it we'll put a liquid metal the a liquid electrode on it and then do the next layer of liquid paint that dielectric mm -hmm. and then do the opposing electrode build up to the right cap uh, value and xyz thickness yeah. Wow. It's really interesting. It's basically yeah. a liquid liquid cap. <laughs> <laughs> How do you produce like billions of capacitors? I don't know what volume just just AVX would make every year, but it's got to be in the billions and tens of billions yeah, sure. of capacitors. It's got to be right. It's just it's, well, it's crazy and you can buy them for next to nothing. Well, not the real high value ones are quite expensive these days, but right. you know, like a, just just a jelly bean low end one is just so cheap. That's true. So much has occurred in terms of uh, the mechanization on this. And wow. it, it, it makes sense. We got exceptionally good, built our own equipment, came up with special mm -hmm. processes. So the selects are exceptionally high. Mm -hmm. And you could 
kind of see why, given that volume. Uh, if we make an error, it's repeated very <laughs> it's <re> quickly. <laughs> right. Yeah, if somebody uh, tweaks something on the production line that they oh, weren't supposed to, you... <laughs> right. right. Okay. It's, it's very cautious, very stable. <laughs> right. Is it? Is it like, are there many people on the production line? Is it like a... Or is it yeah. like as completely automated as you can get it? Well, it's not like a resistor factory. I've had a chance to see one. And I believe they were building a billion plus with, I want to say, eight or ten people. So we're nowhere near that. <laughs> okay. But, right. Uh, but it's not an army of people. Wow, that's incredible. So so what are the different technologies for the, you know, you've got FlexiSafe trademark, but yes. I'm, I'm sure you do different techniques for um, flexible end caps. This is what I've talked about in my video. It'll take the, so as the board, as the board Yes. flexes as the board flexes like that then the capacitor then the end um, terminations can take can decouple that stress from the ceramic um, that's right yeah you've, you've got different techniques trick. for that we do now it uh, it's stabilized to one material system mm -hmm. and um, it's a great trade secret but it, it, it basically <laughs> right. has a conductive epoxy mm -hmm. and that could be very problematic because if it's not the right conductivity, mm. we increase the ESR. I was going to say, yeah, you screw up your ESR, yeah. Right. And does right. that mean so your you ESR start. can change slightly when it flexes? Well, no. We're no? very cautious. It okay. could. Right. That, that's a it question could in theory. to that for an yeah. end user. Right. right. And the other one is ESR could change and suddenly you can get a short if, uh, if the uh, that conductive epoxy is is I, I want to say it without giving out trade secret if it's the wrong okay. conductive epoxy <laughs> right okay <laughs> no it's so all good <laughs> very cautious I, and i'll have to say that the flexible terminations have gotten very good because there is mm. a military spec uh, right. 32535 and they actually call out the use of flexi term or flexible termination material sets Got it. And there's multiple suppliers to that. So it's, yep. uh, but truly as end users, they should be careful to make sure that that mm -hmm. termination is stable with ESR and under environmental conditions. Yes. Yep. And there's on, then on the design uh, side of things, as a designer, you can, you know, if that's an ultra critical spot and uh, you can't afford a short in a capacitor, then you would put uh, two in series. You halve your yes, capacitance, that's right. that's but, a... but it improves your reliability. And that's so, what we're looking at here. This yep. Flexi Safe has the two caps in series. Mm. So uh, this is the traditional. Oh yeah, I, I think we saw solution. that. Yeah, 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 two 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 caps in series there. Yep. Okay. Right. The right. So that's 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 built one. in. So you don't have to do that on yes. the. You don't have to use two parts on the board level. Right. Yep. And here we're showing the ESL of two parts in series versus a single. Uh, of course, the right. value on the Flexi Safe is half, as you said. Yes. And then right. we did a frequency. Uh, uh, plot looking at ESR mm -hmm. and it's, yep. it's there very it is. appealing. Yep. Terrific. They, they, they'd also use those in the automotive market too, wouldn't they? Um, yeah. I, critical I data, self-driving technology. Yep. Right. Yep. Yeah. There's, there's rumors going around that because of the component shortage in the automotive industry, they're putting in dodgy caps instead, like they're putting in non-flex ones instead of flex. <laughs> anyway, well, that's that's know. that's just a rumor. So <laughs> it, maybe yeah. I don't. You know, I'm kind of far out of that. Yeah, no, no. Uh, I'm sure. Like, no, I, I I don't expect a comment <laughs> from ABX yeah. on that. That's not your thing. <laughs> yeah. You just uh, uh, sell them. You don't uh, actually yeah. implement. I know them, our, so. our guys would love to take the orders. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. You know, it's well, a it, to, well, I was just saying about lead times. Um, I, I I don't get involved in lead times, but I just wasn't aware there was any problems but hey, you know so much is going on their usage yeah. is off the chart oh yeah well there was i can't was it five years ago now was the great capacitor shortage that was nuts it was that because there was like one or two major one factory caught on fire i can't remember the details of that i don't what was, really know oh it was yeah it was bad you you could not get a reel of smd you know one mic caps to you know <laughs> didn't matter how well. much you paid you just couldn't get them at one point, yeah. and it was. I, I know we've expanded beyond belief 
And, right. Uh, and that's great. Okay. So, uh, you know, I, I think I'm badge number four or 500, right? And I think now the <laughs> company's at 28 or 30,000, at Ooh. least our division of KSC. Wow. Yeah, so yeah. It's grown. <laughs> That's that's nuts. <laughs> yeah, right, so yes. you're right. So uh, what's this um, pulse pulse withstanding stuff? Yeah. Can you explain well, you what know, makes it a pulse withstanding? I mean, we, man, we're talking twenty four kilovolts, twenty six kilovolts, twenty eight, thirty. Yeah, wow. pretty significant stuff, right? Yeah. So when people want to, we, we realize two things, right? Uh, number one, we build a varistor, which looks like a ceramic capacitor, but in the presence of an electric field it will become conductive. And it's just like mm. the big old MOVs that you used to use on 110, yeah. right? right? But now we can build them down to an O-tool, one size, they don't wear out and all of that. But the pulse with standing caps, when you want to integrate versus clamp, these are ceramics that are used on less sensitive IOs that uh, if you integrate down to a few hundred volts, the, the IC will survive. So this is a big deal. Right. A lot of times we used okay. to pray, right? In the old days, yeah, 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 yeah. 10, exactly. 500 volt part. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. but these are specifically engineered to do this Absolutely. job. What else? Are you, low yeah, inductance, that, high, high, high current jobbies. Yeah. Well, you know what we did? Here's these are three terminal caps. Yeah. And now there's a 10 microfarad, I think a 15 microfarad 0402. Ooh. And what happens is. We've, uh, we've made this into like a T filter. The next slide yep. kind of shows okay. oh, uh, yep. what, what's occurred. Yep, there we go. And basically what we've done is we take out the parallel inductance, looking at that equivalent model. So mm -hmm. we have a low cap C1 to ground, low inductance, and that's thing that could be 10 or 15 microfarads. And then we'll inject or transform that parallel cap into series cap, uh, inductance. Right. So we transform the, the parallel inductance to series. And we end up with a very low Q filter. So that means it's broadband. You mm -hmm. could be 30 dB down across uh, maybe a gigahertz. Right. And you could start that response at maybe, well, 20 megs. And you could have, depending on which part you choose, you, yep. could, you could have parts that uh, have their endpoint 30 dB points at maybe 10 gigs. So it's, it's a neat, cheap, dirty mm. broadband filter. Got it. <laughs> and it saves uh, saves board space too, which is, you know. Oh, it does. Right. And it takes a, a lot of the questions out of yep. like hysteresis on the inductor or temperature mm -hmm. effects on the inductor, et cetera. Got it. It's, that's all taken care of in the part. You don't have to worry about component selection there for your right. capacitor and your inductor and everything else. It just makes the design process right. vastly easier. So, yeah. yeah. But, well, there's, there's, there's some of the benefits there. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. It's just real easy to use. And actually, that's out of date now that we can do up to <laughs> right. 10 or 15 mics. <laughs> but, yeah, it's oh. kind of interesting. But it's easy. You can see the response, and they're yep. kind of interesting. All of this has spice and simulations that are exportable. And, mm -hmm. and uh, of course, all the manufacturers are, are uh, putting out much more yep. uh, spice models, and, of course. Now you're a you're a capacitor manufacturing guy rather than a uh, electronics design engineer. Actually, what is your background? Oh, well, double E. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So double I, E. I okay. Come, come here rather than uh, doing design, but <laughs> right. might be able to do a couple things. Okay. <laughs> What's your standpoint on uh, multiple caps in in parallel for bypassing? <laughs> because well, other, you know, there's a ton of people say that just one, just one big ten mic jobby is right. fine because that's what these impedance curves here you overlay two impedance curves and you're supposed to get a broader lower inductant lower impedance path over a wider frequency yeah, range okay. if you use two caps as opposed well, to one certainly that's true and we've seen that as, as a trend and seen people that want minimum esrs and controlled esrs mm -hmm. for ringing and all that what's interesting is that the low inductance parts uh, the, the LICC, the LGAs, the, the, the ones that we saw before, those kind of change things a little bit where you might be able to use a big bulk cap and one of those. Now, the three terminal caps, this, this feed-through concept, it changed things a little bit further because you might have a, a 10 microfarad cap but it has a very low inductance. So it has a broad frequency of operation. So... Mm -hmm. Although it's very valid to have the multiple caps in, in parallel, um, 
and of course there's negatives to that, right? With yes, it can. Yeah, your poles and zeros with your PCB inductance and it right. resonates to buggery and yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You know, simulation kind of helps you out, but yep. you know, the effort was put into on the low inductance parts, LACC, LGA, and then now this three terminal cap. Mm. I think we're starting to change things. And there's something that we can't really talk about, but imagine a true bulk capacitor that has a feed through characteristic. So that'll be something Ooh. that uh, okay. it'll, it'll be coming out soon. Ooh, oh, yeah, new, capa new capacitor type. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Ooh, exciting. It's specifically for bypass applications? Uh, a lot of applications. Right, <laughs> okay, know? right. I'm sure there's many. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah, but, <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's it's kind of interesting. But, the, you know, the, yeah, yeah. The, it comes back to the metallization control and mm -hmm. the material advances that are occurring. There's a lot of those uh, trends which are reinforcing one another. Yep. And it's it's really going to provide some significant new types of components out there. No, that's the yeah, yeah the shock shock vibration, anti shock yeah, vibration right. stuff. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So the the terminations on the tantalums tend to take quite a bit of stress. And in fact, you know, mm -hmm. one of the uh, best applications for tantalums now. Well, there's great applications. One is on uh, SSDs. To hold up, you know, the dying gasp there, right? Okay. But then, with everything we learned there, we took a relatively standard tantalum, the MNL2 technology, commonly, and they could be a great part for wake-up caps or even low-level scavenging energy harvesting caps. So ILT is seeing a big use or potential use of mm -hmm. ultra-low leakage um, tantalums, small package quite good uh, that's interesting because i never associate low leakage with tantalums that's uh, no. something hey, like as current. an old as an older guy i just don't associate yeah. you know <laughs> yeah well me neither yeah. until i saw the curve I'm, I'm fact, after this i'll send you the curve yes and please. it's amazing if you derate that's it's oh, exponentially okay. dropping so, so that is the trick is it to de to derate them and then the leakage oh, there you go yeah, yeah yeah you know the other one neat one is on on tantalums, the tantalums, the bathtub curve. Okay, it, it it's, it's true, but the the end curve is maybe a thousand years out or so. <laughs> right, okay. So you know they're incredibly reliable parts. Wow. Okay. Yeah, because they they got a bad rep, especially the tag tantalums. You know the old school tag parts with yeah. the you know through hole pins and the blo j just the blob types, which are famous for catching on fire and whatnot. Yeah. Um, well, you know, they actually could self-heal to some extent. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, and that's why we tend to derate them. So, in fact, I have a neat spacecraft story. There is a, yeah. uh, a device that's flying with a tantalum that was installed incorrectly. Oh, oh no, uh, what, a, backwards? Yes, yeah, sir, yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's like a one-point rail, you know, and I think it's a 50-volt part. So uh, it's not recommended, of course. <laughs> but uh, there is some... I guess horror stories in production that oh. kind of uh, turned out well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> right. So we can't name this probe, can we? No. <laughs> no. No. Okay. Right. Okay. Is is the probe or is it a satellite? I can we narrow it down? I, I can't hear you, Dave. It's, no. It's, okay. It's, 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 okay. All right. All right. <laughs> yeah. I, I can't actually say for sure it's our part. I don't know, but I was involved on the meetings. <laughs> right. It was amazing. It was a great thing to attend. Oh, that's great. <laughs> so, what did it die? Did it? No, it's fine. No, it's it's, it's, it's still fine, fine, even though they installed yeah. it backwards. Yeah, but the derating is so massive. Oh, right? okay, so it's, it's so massive, right? You know, Fifty volt part in space that's already mm -hmm. saying it's a you know it's a much higher voltage that we derated to fifty, and they derated right. it to like one point you know whatever so that was part of the design process it wasn't just luck that somebody specced in a higher voltage part they they deliberately derated it and that came in handy that's, yes it came in handy yeah. <laughs> right. that's right it's really handy that's <laughs> kind of an extreme number of derating wasn't it but yeah right yeah. oh wow that's terrific and this shows the internal construction yeah. of those wow is that is that like a little pin in there yeah is that like yeah, a it's, it's got a little wire it's got wire. Right. Yeah. So okay. the wire is, uh, we, we kind of start with some length of that, then we press a, a pill around that. And then uh, it's, uh, we, we basically process the thing after that. 
so you've got uh, essentially wow. a tantalum plug with which is porous, right? Mm. And then uh, the the wire is is going to be your your other end of that. Will basically form a very thin dielectric through an echo electrochemical reaction, and then we'll put on a uh, a counter electrode. And mm. um, this counter electrode is kind of where the, you get the ESR, and that's where the uh, conductor epoxy makes a big difference. Uh, I don't think tantalums are going away at all, mm -hmm. and I think tantalum polymers are going to do a, have a lot of growth. They're going to do really well. Right. Yeah. So what, what's the biggest usage case for tantalum polymers as opposed to MLs? When, when would you want to use a tantalum yeah. instead of a whiz-bang 100 mic multi-layer ceramic cap? Well, stability. You're always going to get yeah. stability, and I think uh, ultimately a uh, you're I, talking I voltage. You're 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 talking yes. voltage stability, temperature stability. Yes. Time, yeah. Right. All of that. Time. Yes. Right. All of it. Um, yeah. Yeah. And and uh, yeah, now incidentally, the tantalum polymer has just had a military spec uh, come out, mm. thirty-two seven hundred. So that kind of reinforces the known and proven history and reliability of the five five three six five military tantalums and flight tantalums. So, you know, these can now be even quite high reliability devices, but the, the amount of cap you can get in there is, is quite startling. So in the, in the commercial world, the tantalum polymers are great for the things like, oh, well, I don't know, it, it might be the SSD drives. Yep. Um, tantalums or even tantalum polymers are ideal on uh, the, the gate, negative gate bias on hemp's and uh, mm -hmm. VDD lines, where you don't want to have a bigger electro, uh, electrolytic. Yep. Yeah, Got electrolytics it. are fine. They could work there. But, yep. um, you know, the tantalums are a much smaller package and, and mm -hmm. also much more reliable. So uh, yeah, right, you'll okay. see a lot of these in flame. Is, is that because of the ceiling you can get in them? Right. The, in, well, in the packaging instead it, of like a metal can sort of like plugged, you know, because they're plugged from the bottom or whatever. In the... Yeah, that's partly true. So we make elect we got electrolytic too, um, and the real trick, as you say, is in the wet electrolytic is to seal that uh, can mm. around the the bottom of it. Uh, there's a seal, and of course, the possibility for that thing to go bad. Yeah. So that's you know a negative on <laughs> aluminum electrolytics. Of course, mm. there's hybrid electrolytics and polymer aluminum electrolytics that yes that get rid of those issues. <clears throat> But, you know, the tantalum is also inherently more reliable uh, than the electric, the, uh, the aluminum electrolytic system. Right. And it's, you know, it's funny, too. Everybody calls them tantalums, but really, they're also an electrolytic. But, uh, uh, right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> gotcha. This, this looks difficult to manufacture. This looks <clears throat> tedious, I guess, to manufacture. Well. More, more tedious than any other type? Yeah, you've got that electro electrochemical uh, reaction and, and the, it's mm -hmm. also well controlled and easy to put these out in the billions I think oh right. okay uh, in fact I think there's wow. a YouTube video on our process oh really yeah. oh okay yeah, I, I'll have to try and find that and link it in yep. yeah I'll try to find it for you too yeah that'd be great yeah. Yeah. okay so so tantalums are you know tantalums are the in thing huh well you know it is and a lot of the FPGA and the real high-end processors, mm -hmm. they're going to be using this technology because it's low inductance. It's inherently yep. lower than the aluminum electrolytic. Uh, you could also, with the multiple case sizes, you have a lot more ease of being close to the processor, easier yep. layout, things like that. The stability mm -hmm. and the ESR is a, a great advantage. So, uh, yeah, there, there's a lot of growth. It's funny mm -hmm. because I could almost say that in the world of semiconductors, passives can tend to limit the semiconductors and performance. Uh, in fact, mm -hmm. I can give you true examples of that. So it's becoming quite important that uh, you're using the right passive. Right. So would anyone use a wet electrolytic for bypassing these days? I can't see why you would. I. For bypassing, yeah, I, actually, I think because of cost. <laughs> so, oh, okay. Oh, well, them. yeah, it's going to be less than a tent, I guess, if you need right. like a hundred mic in, you know, ten right. volts or something, maybe. But yeah, 
Yeah, I think I repeat, I repaired a hot tub board recently. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, with, replace it with a tantalum too. <laughs> uh, right. <laughs> but, uh, it, so no, I think it's true. We, the electrolytics have a lot of great uses, but mm. I think, and although I'm not into pricing, right, I think they right. tend to be fairly low cost. Having said that, though, you know, the polymer electrolytics are quite good, and the hybrid ones, likewise, are, are quite good. They so use those on PC ways. motherboards. They they have a big yeah. advertising thing, polymer capacitors, you know. Our yeah. ones don't fail, you know. Our ones don't dry out and go bad, you know. Right. So, that, that's yeah. That's a big deal. It's a huge sales thing on every, every computer motherboard advertises that they use polymer caps. You yeah. Know. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. I guess they've been burned too many times yeah. in the past. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You've hey. just got so many different types. Yeah, sir. Yeah. It's neat because we also have a hermetic uh, tantalum or tantalum polymer. And oh, we just okay. achieved some flight qualifications. That's, that's it's really interesting. How do, so, how do you hermetically seal that? Well, it will use a Kyocera case. And uh, then process the thing like a standard hybrid. Mm. Uh, but we'll, instead of micro circuits, we'll have the tantalum pellets, the tantalum polymer mm. pellets. We weld them into the material system, uh, you know, into that uh, ceramic package. And then we'll do the proper uh, environment. There's a little bit of magic and special processes. Uh, but uh, of course, we'll fill it with a uh, non moisture type of environment. And uh, there's incredible performance on that part. Wow. Yep. Do you guys like, where do you experiment? Because you're always, you know, you're always experimenting with you know, dozens of different, probably dozens of different things at once. You don't do this yes. on the production line, do you? Do you have like a smaller like R&D line? Because yeah. I assume like you can't just hand make these on the bench and then, oh, oh yeah, here we go. You've got to sort of put a bit more sort of it, when you're designing a new cap like that do you put it through like a mini production that's process right. in the or? old days we actually could kind of do it on the line like old days being like 40 years ago <laughs> right, okay but uh, i remember yeah, yeah. we came up with some types of single air caps by getting mlcc scrap from the sides of the wafer starts <laughs> grinding it down by hand and then metalizing it <laughs> so it's nice. crazy. But yeah, nowadays it's a lot different. So yeah. we've got uh, central R&D is uh, for AVX at any rate is, is in uh, Greenville, South Carolina. Then there's applied R&D and process R&D around the world. Uh, so well you've got three, three different types of R&D. Uh, yeah. So, so can you explain the different, what, what the different types of R&D oh. do? Boy, I'll get in trouble because you know. Oh, okay. All right. No, it's, no, that, that's it, an internal thing. Okay, right. There's well, just different R and D groups. Okay. Yeah, I mean, and different they, they tend to. Right, they tend to specialize yeah. with some things. But yeah, the interest, interesting thing is that we have multiple test labs around the world. Mm -hmm. And for a while, I ran a teeny EMC lab, but that got to be so big. I think there's three of them now around the world. Mm. And uh, then we've got Farfield Chambers in France and San Diego, and uh, you know, it's amazing. So right. it's been a ride, wow. you know, to see from <laughs> maybe two factories to, I don't know, maybe there's 40 now or so. It's, so so you've got EMC Chambers, even yeah. Farfield ones for testing right. your testing well, caps. That's, well, that's for the antenna group. So they actually have... Oh, active. okay. Oh, okay. Hey, there's some really right. <laughs> neat things we can talk about antennas. And I know we're running out of time, but maybe at another No, point, no, no, no. We can keep there's, going. There's <laughs> we can active, go as long as you uh, want. <laughs> well, there's active antennas that we have, and um, I don't do any work with those, but there's some really neat things that are occurring mm. there to make uh, miniature steerable types and tunable antennas. Mm, so okay. That's, that's potentially very right. impactful. But... Uh, and incidentally, we also sell the the, the chambers, uh, oh, flex chambers. Wow! 5G. Yeah, really, it's, it's amazing how big the place is getting, right? But AVX sell, AVX yeah. sell EMC test chambers. Yes, that's right. <laughs> I, yeah. I'll send you a okay. link. But they're really I, neat. Hey, and the software is so easy. It's it's amazing when we start looking at radiation patterns of yeah. antennas. It's so complicated, mm. and they're. HMI is is so wonderful. It's it's you know it's really allows even somebody like me to figure it uh, out. Right, it's excellent. Yeah. Oh wow, yeah, that'd be great. Thing, the neat thing on the antennas, though, on the passives are although there's multiple types and 
you know, stamped and all of that ceramics. But when we could get those metallizations, imagine the 32 different IOs on a 1206. <laughs> that allows us to have such metal control that mm -hmm. we could have a antenna, service mount antenna, effectively with a, uh, a very efficient counterpoise. So Ooh. we might have the ability, or we do have the ability, to have an easier keep out area. Uh, the, keep your, the keep out area is minimal with uh, our device, so it's much easier to use with a good radiation pattern and all of that. And that's a big problem wow. with antennas, right? Yep. You, you have to have a... Uh, you know, it's X amount of keep out area. It's kind of yes. a waste. Yeah, it's a yeah, right. it's a waste. Yeah, exactly. Right. So that, that's yeah. a big deal. So wow. Someday I'd like to show you the metallizations. It's really amazing. Oh what yeah. We can do. That's and that'd be incredible. What other? Um, oh yeah. There's the SMD. Yeah, the SSD. Yeah. Sorry, the SSD. Yeah. Yep. That's yeah, one of the big applications parts. for them. Yeah. yeah. So we actually rate that in terms of ju uh, millijoules. That we can oh, okay. There. Oh, yes. <laughs> right. Yeah, because you're talking about joules of energy, right? When you're talking about right. how much energy is required to do this X amount of process in in X amount of time, yes. you know. So, yeah. yep. Wow. Yeah, it's a big deal. Graceful shutdown. Yeah. Yep. And then all exactly. of our sample kits. <laughs> oh, there's the multi-layer veristi you were talking about. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of neat because yeah. it looks like a ceramic cap. Yeah, but yeah. it's a zinc oxide. And remember the old radial uh, ML, MLVs yes. and how those would wear out? Well, those would wear out because the grains were inconsistent. So oh. the electric field stress would cause some to die early, right? Oh, but really? Now, it just, wow. Yeah, how that, would they die? In the old days. How would they die? Oh, they'd become resistive and then flame. Yeah, oh. so the big old yeah. Hey, I've got a great story. So I, I got yeah. a I got a pin I got an evil Knievel pinball game for oh. sixty dollars no. because they didn't realize the electrolyt or the uh, the uh, MOV blew out. Yeah, and it wouldn't allow any power, of course, to the machine. Wow. So we took that out and uh, fixed it. <laughs> so, oh. uh, but anyway, hey, these these multi layer varistors are neat because we have exceptionally tight grain size control. Mm. And believe it or not, they could take tens of thousands of strikes with no wow. wear out. And it's very important because it has an advantage over a TVS diode because you could take more current. With all of those multiple electrodes, yep. uh, you could you know divide up the current that way. Right. Yeah. And there's also an off-state cap. So that's something you use in your favor because most of the oh. time, you know, this, this isn't doing anything, right? There's yeah, no exactly. How much capacitance are we talking about? Well, it varies. You can get down to 0.2 picofarads, I believe. Yeah. But I think we are now up to 47 or 100 nanofarads. There's so many advances. That's you used to useful. Be able to remember yeah. this stuff, right? Yeah, it's really yeah. useful. Right. Yeah. So, like on a relay or motor drive, mm, stuff like that. Yep. And, and, and even on can For lines, sure. that's, that's okay. simple, right? You can replace it with, uh, with one part. As I think well. there are arrays, and there's also the feed through filter the you know the food uh, terminal yeah. part right so then you get a very deep notch of attenuation mm. because these electrodes are exceptionally highly conductive so wow. uh, that's that's you know where you could increase yep. the effective cue of that filter right in clamping and then there's Ooh, also a neat situation so not to trash clamp diodes <laughs> okay. they have great advantages right what we're showing here is an x-ray so uh, on the top left picture you've got a picture it looks kind of like a teeny ceramic chip cap, right? Mm -hmm. And we're competing maybe against the DFN uh, ceramics, or excuse me, uh, diode. And if we do a top-down, center top picture shows the uh, die, and that's, uh, you know, kind of shoved in between uh, basically copper electrodes. Mm -hmm. And those heavy copper electrodes, you can see the cross-section on the right, upper right. Yep. And those actually act like heat pipes. So oh. we can have a miniature die that has essentially a heat pipe taking the, the uh, heat out of it. And that's where we could be on Interesting. The HDMI, super low cap stuff. Right, right. so you got yeah. higher power handling in a right. smaller package. Ultra miniature package, right. Ultra wow. and stuff, yep. Very cool, that's terrific. Yeah. yeah, I know you did something on heat pipes in the old days. Oh well, yeah, I've done that. a couple of videos on thermals, yeah. thermal so stuff and things like that. We're learning a lot about heat pipes and right. you know, where to put them in. Yep. Yeah. I, I I wouldn't have thought about that from a in in, in that sort of package size, but it matters. Um, yeah, yeah, I can see I see how that matters. 
Um, yeah, and there's work being done actually on very high power devices mm. with uh, heat piping as well. What are, what are these RF coax things? Well, you know, it's neat. It's the insulation displacement capac- uh, connector, that is. Yeah. Uh, where you've got opposing phosphor brun tines and you don't even have mm. to uh, strip the wire. You just pop the wire in between the terminals and you get a gas tight fitting. So there's no oxidation. Nope. Oh, gas well, tight. In the world of, oh, yeah. Okay. Wow. Really, so okay. they're even. I believe they're flying on some of the uh, aircraft that were uh, like Boeing's, etc. Wow. Or, okay. Uh, but the uh, the RF version of that is uh, really good for the center connector and uh, mm-hmm. or the center uh, conductor and the the shield. So we have a uh, a, a non soldering, quick, easy to use uh, connector for uh, miniature coax. Very cool. It's, it's brutal trying to <laughs> measure coax. Oh yeah, I know. Yeah, no, it's yeah, yeah, it's horrible. Yeah. <laughs> it really is. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, oh, you, yeah, so you guys obviously do more than caps. Um, oh yeah. Is, no, no. no. And then there's some of the uh, thin film stuff, right? We got yep. actually uh, two or three thin film fabs around the world. Uh, and then there's the the big heavy duty stuff, the one that you could have for your. Uh, table base right mm-hmm. that are about the size a couple hundred pounds <laughs> but uh, of course all the different types of films and uh, in the world of now uh, distributed power and, and yep. green power and all of that that's becoming quite uh, you know important and useful so how many different types of poly <laughs> film capacitors are there <laughs> there's oh, just wow this is tough <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I would say we're building with four Four. And there's probably right. four majors out there. The, yeah, PT, yep. PPN, PPS, PPS. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's crazy. What are the – can you give us a breakdown of the, when, when you would use the different types? I don't know if we have a slide here for the different applications for the different types of poly uh, material. Be, uh, basically, yeah, here we go. Sort of oh, – I think it was, it was sort back, of on the bottom it? of that slide. <laughs> but uh, some of it's temperature, some of it's voltage, uh, and some of it's just – case uh, value range right you know, what uh basically they're, they're they're not like the k of uh multiple thousands in in ceramics <laughs> of course they have great yep. other properties right you think that this is moisture you're confident yeah. how confident oh absolutely Ab- oh, absolutely what absolutely Send me some right. and i'll put them on the sem <laughs> oh <exactly. laughs> what what would we see under a scanning microscope like that, what would we see if we did well, put one under there? I, I might be able to see some of the, uh, well, certainly we'd see some of the error or the, the uh, reformed electrode on the, on the punch through. Okay. And we yeah. might be able to see some of the patterning, the failure of, of moisture. Right. We'd probably try to look at the thing spectrographically as well and see what types of oxides we've grown. Okay, that's, yeah, so the moisture attacks the metal and then they form oxides. Right. Is that? Right, that's, right. that's where Is that how it works? changes and, yes. So, so with, with the moisture, like, it, it just physically eats away the metal and it just vanishes yeah. or? Yeah, that, that's basically true. It turns into oxides and we start changing resistances. Right. Once we start changing resistances under X amount of current or voltage, now we have a different E field. We have some heating effects that occur heating effects start to uh, accelerate potentially the uh, mm-hmm. rate of degradation. And then if there happens to be some transient event, that could even further uh, accelerate this thing kind of exponentially. But if a year old part like this fails, is it just going to be, oh, it's just got a bad seal on it? Maybe. Is, is that the most yes. likely scenario? I think that's true, yes. In fact, yeah. I could tell you a fact. We've got, mm. uh, I think we've been building films since uh, maybe it's 25 years, and there's actually been zero failures. Um, now, dead shorts, that is, right? Oh, de- dead shorts. Okay, yes, because right. these are designed to fail open, right? These are yes, class of capacitors. Right. So, yeah. Right. Yeah, and some of these dead shorts would be disastrous. Imagine, you know, oh, yeah. <laughs> and yep. large compressors and things. <laughs> So, so do you have any experience with the reefer um, caps, the paper, which, which they still make, don't they? I think they still I'm manufacture. Sure. I, the, I'm going to have to claim ignorance on that. Okay. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. But do you know anything about the failure mode in the reefer no. caps? No. no okay. I, 
Because um, you guys have never made paper, old school paper caps uh, like that. Maybe in the 70s, but that's... Well, right. in fact, Aero, <laughs> AVX was actually Aerovox, and mm. uh, I think there was some history. Of course, that's you know, <laughs> right. a long time ago. Yep. Yeah. Of course, yeah. Anyone who repairs any vintage test gear from the yeah, anything vintage from you know the seventies or eighties is if if they got those reefer caps in there, you just don't power it on because they'll explode <laughs> because they've got so much yeah. moisture in them. Um, so I carefully we, cut yeah. the case and then put our parts on the inside. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, some people do that. There's people who will actually get uh, reefer. They'll keep the case because they want the vintage look of it so you know vintage radio enthusiasts and stuff they'll actually keep the case they'll actually grind it all out all the material and they'll put a modern cap inside the actual yeah. case and keep the case just to get that vintage yeah, look i do that on the uh, old heath kits that we've rebuilt oh right take yes. out the old electrolytics and right yep the case <laughs> yeah. it's neat stuff Oh, so so moisture ingress inside a film cap can't really cause a short can it? Is that That's something that you shouldn't worry correct. about? It's just, it'll just yes. eat away the metallization and cause a drop in capacitance. That's right. It's just going to go away mm. gracefully. Oh, right. Okay. So many different varieties. And can you use an X right. class instead of a Y class and vice versa and and stuff like oh, that? Devastating. And and now then you mm. can throw the complexity of EVs. So inside mm. the electric vehicle, yeah. does it have to be AECQ two hundred plus uh, safety agency rated? Uh, so it gets really complicated. I'm, I'm afraid we have to have a lawyer and Daniel answer. <laughs> right. Okay. But we got the parts. <laughs> <laughs> got it. So, yeah, EVs. Yeah. So you're talking about um, for use in the control electronics for the actual battery pack itself, for the high-voltage yeah. battery pack, which some of them can be 800 volts now, can't they? Some of the newer yeah, battery right. packs in EVs. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's There's some really impressive work going on there. Mm. And, uh, you know, many times films are very attractive, especially as the voltage gets higher. Yep. And, um, yeah, there's, that's amazing what, how vehicles have changed. They really have. Is, is film the only way to go for high voltage caps? No, you would use uh, glass. You'd have glass ones, wouldn't you, for the, like, the really ultra huge ones you were talking about, you know, size of a cabinet? Yeah, well, in fact, there was a, uh, a recent amount of work done uh, by a university in America with a glass device for power drives. Now, I don't think it was practical or cost effective at the point, but mm -hmm. they have had work ongoing with that. Right. Um, mainly what I see is electrolytics uh, as the maybe I would say lower cost possibly, but I don't know if they're mm -hmm. low cost. Uh, but they're having some practical high voltage limitations. And I, I think in yeah. the future, it's probably going to be film. Um, it's neat because, as I said before, we're starting to do some heat piping within the, uh, uh, well, the, the formed leads, but they aren't really leads. They're actually bus bars. <laughs> right. And uh, you can get some high frequency response on that. You could reduce inductance. So there's a whole lot to be talked about with high power films and how to optimize mm -hmm. the frequency response. But yeah, with the glass ones, you wouldn't, you, you'd get very low capacitances, wouldn't you? How thin, like you wouldn't be able to make the glass as thin as you could on film caps and stuff like well, that, would you? Th they actually talked, I believe, precipitating glass onto mm -hmm. an electrode. So it was quite as in like like a sputtering yeah. thing, like a yes. Is, is that what you're talking Something about? Something along that line. Wow. Yeah. yeah, and and that's why I think it's kind of not really practical. Although having said that, I probably <laughs> made it. You know, it's guaranteed to work now. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's funny. My first job within uh, AVX was on glass dielectrics themselves, mm -hmm. and we made thicknesses of about one thousandth of an inch. Maybe oh, one wow. point two thousand. Okay, so you could bend them quite, uh, you know, effectively around maybe around a six-inch uh, radius or so. Maybe. Wow, really? That's yeah. that's amazing. Yeah, glass had a lot of advantages. It was exceptionally stable. Uh, the, it was probably the most reliable part out there. The K factor was mm. only approximately eight, so it's not too much. <laughs> yeah. Now, on on this film here. 
we when I first started to roll it out, it was like clear, and then like the sort of like I started to see some like like a sputtering of material, and then yes. it then it got more dense, and it eventually reached a point. Is that because they're sputtered, or is that or are they actually a metal? Do they manufacture them as a film and then cut them? Uh, like how yeah. does that work? The in theory, I believe the consistency of the film color should be the same from the start of your DPA yep. uh, to the end. However, in the start, I believe that it's very easy for moisture to attack that. And it's most likely because the shoopage allowed um, a poor, uh, well, adhesion, and you got the uh, moisture in at that point. Right. So um, I believe that's what occurred. And then, of course, as the resistance increase between the shoopage and most likely the electrode uh they're basically that uh, metallization just moisturized away oxidized away <laughs> right. did did its job on going away yes so oh. it's actually a good point though because you would think that the consistency of the color of the film would be the same from the start to the yes. end. Yes. Yeah. I I, I I expected just a sudden start and then boom, like and yeah. and then just hit a metal layer. So and that's what you should have. Right. So but is it actually a moisture. sputtering? Is it is it a sputtering process? Do you sputter the metal yeah. onto the film? Yes, and it's continuous. So right. you might go for okay. well, I'm sure it's all proprietary. So you go for yeah. a long ways, <laughs> and then yep. you have these. Uh, um, it looks almost like saran wrap that's metalized, and, mm -hmm. and then you'll cut it into the right width, and then yep. you'll uh, wind that around something that looks like a bike wheel. Mm -hmm. uh, well, depending upon what you're building. If you're building surface mount, you might wind it around a, a big diameter and then cut the... Uh, and then chop them. Yeah, I've got a graphic yeah. for that. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And then if you're doing the, uh, the power films... You might wind them into the size of a donut or a bagel or something like that. Hmm. And uh, then they could be pressed, mechanically pressed, ah. to be deformed and fit more efficiently in a square box. Oh, so <laughs> squish them down yeah, so, to make a small... Yeah, you, <laughs> that, that's right. great. Yeah, right. That's great. Is it, so do you, is it all sputtering or do you do, are there processes and, and types of caps that would have a metal... Um, you know, you would have like a roll, like you have your roll of your poly put the kettle on film, and then you've got your roll of your metal film, and you just wind them together. Is there any? Uh, I don't know of anyone building films that way. Were they, yes. okay, not now, but did they used to do it that way, or has it always been sputtering? I, I think there was some that occurred. Okay. Yeah, and, right. and I, it might not have been uh, film, it may have been another material system, but yeah, that fact mm. that was done. But okay, because a lot of uh, graphics out there will show that they'll show like, oh, you've got a film of metal and you've got a film of poly and yeah. you roll them together. And I guess that's too simplistic, right? They just do that for well, graphic purposes. I think that's not the case anymore. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and but the reason would be, you know, you're you're um, you probably want a hundred angstrom on the the electrode and mm -hmm. the it's gonna be hard to roll that out and you're going to have uh maybe one micron to maybe 20 or so for the mm. film itself so it's uh, right it's, it's okay. much more efficient to do the deposition yep. right so you'd easily lose half or three quarters of of your capacitance if you did it as a rolled right. metal yeah it'd right. be difficult yes so sputtering all right well Thank you very much, Ron. This has been uh, awesome. Um, <laughs> I was completely Thank wrong. I just went into this video with the mindset that it's all self-healing and I didn't think about moisture. Um, <laughs> well, who <yeah>. knew? <laughs> right. <laughs> and so th th this is going to be a surprise to a lot of people, I think. Well, that, um, it's a good yeah, surprise. <laughs> it's, no, no, well, it, it introduced it, something to think about. Um, is like, should, as electronics designers, should we avoid you know, if we use them in these sorts of applications, um, where like a, a capacitive dropper, should we avoid um, like a no-name brand sourced cap for this reason? Oh, or are they all pretty good? I, <laughs> or I don't know all... if I could comment on no, that. No, you can't comment? Okay. <laughs> Just... But I'd have to say films are a good yep. part to use, and it's probably right. a great application for that. Yeah. Yep. Well, all right, it's been awesome. Thank you very much, Ron. It's been uh, very eye-opening.
Um, <laughs> well, next time I'll turn the lights on. Sorry about that. All right, it's yeah, see, here. it's getting a bit <laughs> dark. That's all right. <laughs> no, we we have been going for an hour and a half, and uh, yeah, there will be an extended version of this. So, yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. Thanks. It's been it's very been informative and awesome. Great, thanks, thank mate. You. See ya. Goodbye now. <laughs>